Hi, I want to welcome you to this, our third edition of Grants World. And today we're going to have featured speaker is Harold Hoser, who's going to talk about Grants World and Grant and Lincoln. So look forward to that. We will hear from Ann Marshall, our executive director, who will bring you up to speed on what's going on at the Grant Library. And there is a lot, I might add. Also, we have a segment on Grant in the News, celebrating Grant's promotion. More on that in a minute. And then John Sampson, our board member, will talk about the success of the book club. So these are the segments we're going to have in this issue. Welcome and enjoy. Greetings from the Grant Library. I'm happy to give you a little update on some of the things we have going on these days. I think the biggest project we're working on right now is, of course, our brand new freestanding library that is going to be built adjacent to campus. Right now, we're currently working on finding an architect. Uh, we've got several finalists in the running, and hopefully we'll have one selected sometime in the next month or so, and then that project can get underway. And if, as always, I look forward to sharing any updates we have on that with you in the future. Um, we've also been really busy planning our annual meeting, which is going to take place in Washington, D.C. on April 28th through April 30th. We're really excited about it. The theme is going to be Grant and the Presidency, and the whole, uh, the whole program is going to be based around the Lafayette Square area. Our accommodations are going to be in the historic Willard Hotel, where, of course, Grant stayed on his 1864 visit to the city. And we're working on a couple of really special tours. Our Saturday afternoon programming is all going to take place at the historic Decatur House, which houses the White House, the Center for White House History, and is the home to the White House Historical Association. So we're going to have tours of the facility. That's where we're going to have uh, three speakers on Saturday uh, and our lunch and dinner there as well. So it's shaping up to be a really special meeting and I hope that you all can join us. Finally, I'd like to thank everyone who responded to my call at the end of last year to uh, donate money to the U.S. Grant Association. Uh, quite a few of you responded and we are so thankful for your generosity. It really helps us with our mission of outreach to get out and tell the rest of the world about Ulysses S. Grant, his accomplishments, and his legacy. So until next time, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and I'll see you soon. An overdue honor for an often overlooked American president and military commander. On Friday, President Biden signed a measure authorizing a record $858 billion for the Pentagon. The National Defense Authorization Act includes pay raises for service members, funding for ships, tanks and aircraft, and military support for Taiwan and Ukraine. But buried within the legislation is a provision giving Ulysses S. Grant a promotion to the military's highest rank. David Martin explains why it's coming 157 years after the Civil War ended. General Ulysses S. Grant had been consigned to history as the stolid and plodding Union general who defeated the daring and dashing Confederate General Robert E. Lee. No longer. If there's an historic wrong, let's make it right. Senator Sherrod Brown sponsored a provision in the massive defense spending bill that promotes Grant to General of the Armies, a rank held by only two other Americans, George Washington, commander of the Revolutionary Army, and Black Jack Pershing, commander of American forces in World War I. I think it's uh, always good to revisit history and to shine a bright light on those who have done well. Brown could be accused of bias since he's the senator from Ohio, which was Grant's home state. But ask retired General David Petraeus. Grant truly was the man who saved the Union. His actions, more than any other individual in uniform, that ultimately ensured that the North won that war and that the Union was preserved. As America's deadliest war ground on with no end in sight, President Lincoln turned in desperation to Grant 
who took command and chased Lee all the way to the courthouse at Appomattox and accepted his surrender. He is arguably the greatest battlefield general in American military history. Uh, no other U.S. Army general did what he did, which was to demonstrate true brilliance on the battlefield at every level of warfare. A portrait quite at odds with many of the historical depictions of Grant. He was dismissed as incompetent or corrupt or an alcoholic that couldn't manage his demons and his alcohol. Lincoln, when told that Grant drank, famously responded, find out what he drinks, it, give it to the other generals, at least he fights. The wheel of history has turned and Grant now stands on a pedestal with only two other Americans, while statues of Robert E. Lee are coming down. For CBS Saturday Morning, this is David Martin at the Pentagon. Hello, everybody. Uh, Jim asked me to say a few words about our book club, which we started. Uh, we had our first meeting this year, and it was very well attended. We had about 16 people. We talked about volume one of Grant's memoirs had some stimulating conversations and some questions. Uh, the February meeting, which is going to be on, yes, February 16th, we'll cover volume two of the memoirs. The Looking ahead, the uh, March 16th meeting will address Ron White's biography, American Ulysses. It was decided that we should cover one of the major biographies, and the consensus of opinion was that Ron White's was the one that uh, should be uh, addressed. So that's going to be the March meeting. And then from thereafter, uh, we vote on which book we will address in the next month. So we have a, a month to get ready for the for that uh, particular discussion. Uh, we decided besides the grant books, we occasionally will tackle a grant subject rather than a, a, an actual book. So it could be something like grants generalship, uh, Grant's uh, family relationships, uh, maybe the um, everlasting and ongoing debate over Grant and alcohol, or something specifically related to Grant rather than a specific uh, book title. So that will also be thrown into the mix. With the uh, overwhelming amount of material written about Grant, uh, we should never run out of material. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the um, nominations for future books and the discussions that will follow. So again, I invite everybody who has an interest in the book club to join us. Again, it's the third Thursday of every month, and it is uh, informal, and people uh, have uh, seemed to enjoy it so far, so I think it will continue to be a success, and I encourage you to join us. Today, I would like to welcome Stan Purdy, an Ohio State native. Stan is a graduate of Ohio State University College of Law and was in practice for 56 years, retiring just a year ago. Stan is the president of the Ulysses S. Grant Homestead Association, and we'll talk about all the great things they do. Stan? Well, Jim, I want to thank you for uh, scheduling this interview uh, today. I think it's a great idea that you're doing these uh, videos and, and interviews. It's great to keep the membership uh, interested and up to date on what's going on with the various sites. And now, we, uh, we of course have the homestead, boyhood home where Grant grew up, lived there 16 years, longer than he lived anywhere else. We have the school that he attended uh, up until the time he went to uh, well, uh, he went to a couple of other schools, but this is the primary school that he went to. Uh, we have a great statue of, of uh, Ulysses Grant that we worked on for three or four years. And we now have murals. Our association was formed in 1972 for the 150th birthday celebration. And uh, we've done a, a uh, we had a three or four day celebration then. We've uh, celebrated Grant's birthday every year since then in various forms. Uh, the schoolhouse uh, is a replica of a frontier school, which Georgetown was a frontier town when 
Grant first moved here is in in the same uh, style as it was when Grant attended the uh, uh, school. And in fact, we have one of the benches that we believe he used or was in the school when he was there. Uh, but Georgetown, we feel, is one of the greatest uh, grant sites in the country with the number of sites we have actual uh, places to come. Um, I appreciate what Frank Scaturro did in trying to get each state to recognize April 27th as Grant's birthday. And uh, I put together a proclamation and sent it to the governor. And in the lame duck uh, legislature, they passed that uh, bill. And we now have US, Day, U.S. Grant Day in Ohio. Well, the uh, Ohio History Connection has spent quite a bit of money on the homestead in the last five, six, seven years. Um, over a million dollars, they, they uh, restored it to the, uh, the way it was in uh, 1837 when Grant went to West Point. Now the assets in the uh, homestead itself, uh, of course, furnishings, uh, wallpaper, carpet of the period. And the most special thing that we have is our Grant animatron. This is a um, character that is linked up to a computer. Uh, Grant is pictured as a 16 year old. We also have the tannery uh, where his father worked. Uh, it has not been restored. It uh, is a, was a private residence. I've had the fortune to come to three or four annual meetings of the association, of course, now at the Presidential Library. And uh, I understand it's going to be in Washington this year. And I would certainly urge uh, uh, as many members as possible would consider uh, coming to the annual meeting of the association. I've had a wonderful time, met a lot of people that are fellow uh, folks that are interested in grant. I would urge many of the association members to come. Today, I'm interviewing Harold Holzer, who is the Jonathan Fatton Director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College, a post he assumed in 2015 after 23 years Vice President for External Affairs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Holzer served for six years as Chairman of the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Foundation and for the previous 10 as the co-chair of the U.S. Lincoln Bicentennial Commission, appointed by President Bill Clinton. He is also the co-founder and chairman of the Lincoln Forum. Holzer was awarded the National Humanities Medal by President George W. Bush. Holzer is the author, co-author, or editor of 55 books on Lincoln, the Civil War, and the history of the American media. His latest book is The President Versus the Press, From the Founding Fathers to Fake News, Holzer, who lectures throughout the country, has appeared in Lincoln-related onstage performances with such actors as Sam Waterston, Richard Dreyfuss, and Liam Neeson at venues including the White House, Ford's Theater, the Library of Congress, and George H. W. Bush and Bill Clinton Presidential Libraries. The lead historical consultant for Steven Spielberg's Lincoln, he has received nine honorary degrees. Holzer and his wife, Edith, live in Rye, New York, and have two daughters and two grandsons. Harold? Thank you, Jim. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, Grant's favorite city, New York, uh, where he spent so much of his later years, unfortunately, where he was uh, ruined. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but uh, my office, which is in Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt's home in, uh, in, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, is only a few blocks from uh, Grant's New York City home in Manhattan. Um, I wonder if FDR and Eleanor, or indeed uh, 
FDR's mother, who built their house, knew that Grant had been there and, of course, had to give the house up when he lost his, uh, his, his fortune to the wards. Um, but it's all, uh, it's an interesting presidential neighborhood. Um, and I think of Grant every time I pass the house because it's marked. And uh, of course, uh, Grant's tomb is not all that far from where I live and work. And um, so anyway, Grant, it, people don't often think of New York as a Grant city, but it is in, 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 if you look. And Grant's tomb remains an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary uh, destination for New Yorkers and tourists. So you've asked me to talk a little bit about the Lincoln and Grant relationship and then and then kind of focus on the grant image which is something that i wrote about back in 2000 with mark neely in a book called the union image and uh, uh have have spent a lot of time thinking about i used to talk about the grant image with a, a great deal with john y simon uh, the founding editor of the grant papers of course and uh, because john wrote a little booklet about the grant image for an exhibition, I think it was a Library of Congress exhibition, and it remains the only full-length publication on the Grant image. So he always wanted me to do a book on the Grant image, and I've come close a couple of times, but it never came to pass. John's will remain the standard. Anyway, Lincoln and Grant, what a fascinating relationship. I mean, it's most famous, I guess, in its early iterations for uh, Lincoln's admiration of Grant's early victories from afar. We've all heard the perhaps uh, um, unprovable but irresistible comment that Lincoln allegedly made when he was warned that Grant was a heavy drinker and therefore unreliable. And Lincoln said something like, send a barrel of whatever he's drinking to my other generals, implying that he had faith in Grant and uh, and the others were too timid by comparison. I don't know if we've ever put our finger on where or when he made that statement, but it's it's it sounds like Lincoln. And uh, but for and for a while, in 1862, uh, beginning in 1862, Grant was really, the Lincoln administration's military salvation. Because in the midst of uh, terrible losses in the East, Grant was piling up extraordinary, if costly, victories in the West, beginning uh, with, uh, with uh, the forts and then moving on to Shiloh, of course. Uh, Grant was the silver lining uh, for an otherwise miserable first full year of the war. But still, uh, Grant remained in the West and Lincoln remained in Washington. And although Lincoln visited the Army of the Potomac often, and, and as an interesting side note, Jefferson Davis visited his armies more often, Lincoln never did go West to visit the Western theater or his Western commanders. He did communicate with Grant, and the communications are interesting, especially if you compare them with the communications that uh, that Lincoln initiated with his more recalcitrant commanders in Virginia. Um, you know, famous example is the testy correspondence he had with George McClellan. McClellan telling him he couldn't move forward because his horses were fatigued from the Battle of Antietam. And Lincoln famously wrote, pardon my asking, but what, your, what have your horses done since the Battle of Antietam that would fatigue anything? That's the kind of thing he would never write to Ulysses S. Grant, even if he was irritated, even if he, he never had to worry that Grant wasn't being aggressive, that Grant wasn't planning action or pursuing action. Grant was always on the move and that always gave Lincoln hope. And I think going back onto the Grant side, I think Grant appreciated 
uh, the the confidence that Lincoln had in him. Now, there was a chain of command issue of sorts in that Lincoln uh, that Lincoln seldom communicated directly to Grant, and Grant seldom communicated directly with Lincoln, because Halleck, General Halleck, was there as an intermediary, and as John Marzalek has written so convincingly in his biography of of uh, of uh, Henry Halleck. Halleck did not enjoy giving credit to Grant, did not enjoy sharing credit with Grant, probably didn't even deserve to share the credit that Grant won early in the war. And he was kind of a thorn in Grant's side, but Lincoln did keep the chain of command in operation. I think one of their, the most wonderful bits of correspondence um, developing their relationship came after Vicksburg, when uh, in July 1863, Lincoln is again has a comparison to make between East and West, Eastern theater and Western theater, Eastern commander and Western commander. Uh, and in July 63, he he writes to uh, George Meade, who did not pursue General Lee after Gettysburg, said you had the you had them in the hollow of your hand. You, we could have ended this war, for some paraphrasing, as it is the war will go on indefinitely and I am distressed about it. Now, Lincoln never sent that letter because he thought it would break Meade and force his resignation. He filed it, but it gives a sense of his view. Whereas with Grant, uh, around the same period, because Vicksburg fell the same day that Lee withdrew from Gettysburg, Lincoln is exultant and also tells Grant that he now sees what Grant's strategy was and, and says to him on another occasion or on, on one of these occasions, you were right and I was wrong. Can you imagine, can anyone imagine a commander in chief putting such a sentiment on the record? I mean, presidents are no longer ever wrong. They never say they're wrong about anything. Um, but Lincoln was willing to cede superior strategic intelligence to Ulysses S. Grant. So I think that that twin victory, of course, sustained Lincoln in 1863, propelled him into re-election mode. In the early days of the campaign of 1864, um, opened a new vein in their in their relationship, which is seldom discussed, but I think interesting. Now, remember, Grant had voted for Stephen Douglas in 1860, or he hadn't voted for him. He said if he could have voted, he would have voted for Stephen Douglas. He, he wasn't around to vote, and there was no absentee voting uh, in 1860, but he did, he did admit in his memoirs uh, that he would have voted for Douglas. So he's kind of a war Democrat until he becomes closely affiliated with Lincoln. And in 1864, Lincoln clearly wants not to change horses in midstream, to quote another uh, well-known Lincoln aphorism. And uh, there are many members of the Republican establishment who do not want Lincoln to seek a second term. First of all, Presidents have not sought second terms or, or won second nomination since Andrew Jackson. And that's 25 years or so between uh, presidents seeking re-election. Many people believe the tradition had been established, just as George Washington had established a two-term tradition, that after Jackson, presidents had established a one-term tradition. So a number of Republicans, uh, influencers, as we would call them today, primarily Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, began advancing um, other names. Salmon P. Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury, whose campaign fizzled pretty early, after which there was focus on a number of military men, principal among them, Ulysses S. Grant. And I think there was a moment there, after months of really ideal uh, relations between a commander-in-chief and a, and, a, and a general, that Lincoln was deeply concerned that Grant could mount 
a strong challenge to him, either as a Democrat, because Grant had not really declared his, his permanent political affiliation in the new order of things, or as a, as a war Democrat, as a war Democrat or as a Republican. Uh, I think Lincoln was fearful. And there is an example of that in one of the images of, uh, of Ulysses S. Grant, a painting uh, by John Antrobus, uh, done in 1863 of Grant at Vicksburg. And this painting was uh, completed uh, with, uh, at the initiation of Grant's friends in Illinois, and it was taken to Washington and put on view at the U.S. Capitol. And Lincoln had uh, an interesting political slash public relations decision to make. And that is, do I ignore this display and go on about my business and be president? Or do I go up to Capitol Hill to join the thousands of people who are going to pay homage to Grant by viewing the painting? I think it was kind of a tough political decision, but as usual, as he did when he said, you were right and I was wrong, to Grant, he, Lincoln erred on the side of um, modesty and respect. And he did indeed go up to, President, to Capitol Hill, not that usual for a president even then, and stood in line and looked at the portrait of General Grant. And remember, they still hadn't met. Um, so the painting is not remarkable, it's, you know, not Grant in action, it's Grant holding field glasses and surveying the field at Pittsburgh. But when you see this picture, think of it as a painting that President Lincoln felt for political reasons that he had to go and view when it was first displayed uh, in the U.S. Capitol. And that takes us to April of 64. Grant is promoted to general of the armies. Finally, finally, they get to meet. Think of it. The war has been going on for three years. Grant is Lincoln's most successful general. Uh, we know Mary Lincoln doesn't like him because he loses too many men. But Lincoln likes him. And so there is the famous uh, reception at the White House for General Grant, uh, which is uh, perhaps not... Uh, perfectly illustrated in, uh, in this famous painting, but uh, is never, nevertheless uh, sort of replicates that moment. Grant and Lincoln visiting, being greeted by throngs of diplomats and military men and civilian officers of the government at a reception at the White House that becomes so crowded that Grant has to stand on one of the White House sofas so he could be seen above the crowd. We know he's not a big guy, and Lincoln is. The comparison probably doesn't benefit him, so he stands on a sofa for that reception. And I, can you imagine Mary Lincoln's um, reaction when this visitor is standing with his army boots on the sofa uh, in the East Room? And of course, we know the famous story that just before going to that event, Grant had tried registering at the Willard Hotel next door to the White House. Um, and uh, the U.S. Grant Association is going to get a chance to go to the Willard Hotel in, in a few weeks from when we're taping this, uh, Jim, and, uh, and we're going to get to see that space, well, the modern version of that space. They didn't, they didn't recognize Grant at the Willard, which says something about the Grant image, which we'll get back to. And uh, only opened up a room for him when he wrote U.S. Grant and Son in the, uh, in the Willard uh, Registry. Only then did a room become uh, available. And of course, the hotel was soon abuzz about the fact that the hero was staying there. Anyway, Grant uh, is at the reception and then, uh, uh, of course, meets with the cabinet and their warm relationship their warm in-person relationship begins officially. I don't know what it was about the two of them when they were face-to-face. -face. You know, not exactly, because again, Grant was a foot shorter, well, nearly a foot shorter. 
but they hit it off. They had cordial, warm relations for the rest of the war. Lincoln's, uh, and of course, Lincoln is renominated when Grant disdains interest. He firmly says, I'm not interested in the presidency in the next couple of months after that initial meeting. Lincoln brushes off all challenges and easily wins by acclamation the, the nomination. But the Overland campaign of the next few months is so brutal, so slow, so bloody, that there is a fear that, ironically, after all the confidence that each man has shown in the other, that it's, uh, it, it might actually contribute to Lincoln's defeat. And as we know, a number of military uh, successes uh, kind of unrelated to Grant rescue Lincoln from that certainty of defeat. Of course, we don't have polling in the, in the mid-19th century, but we do know that Lincoln believed he was going to lose that his campaign manager, Henry Raymond, thought he was gonna lose. Um, and um, what happens next, the Kearsarge uh, uh, sinks the Alabama in, off the coast of France. The Battle of Mobile Bay goes the Union's way. Sheridan's ride excites the public. And of course, Sherman catch, captures Atlanta on September 1st, the same day that Lincoln's old military nemesis George McClellan is nominated by the Democrats. Talk about a bad, bad, badly timed political convention. Uh, and then the die is cast and Lincoln seems likely to win. And he does. I think the, the warmest part of their relationship comes in the, in the period of February, March, 1865, when Lincoln not only goes often to the front, uh, to City Point in Petersburg to visit Grant's army, to confer with Grant and Sherman and Admiral Porter and others. Uh, but as Grant seems to understand, as busy as he is, that these visits provide solace and rest for an increasingly emaciated, uh, weary Lincoln. And Grant, for all of his, uh, excuse me, Grant, for all of his responsibilities and cares, takes, um, takes Lincoln in, urges him to visit, urges him to kind of vacation. That's the kind of vacation Lincoln wants, to be with the troops, to be with Grant, to be in on the final days of the war. Indeed, he is in on the, on the fall of Petersburg and... Uh, we all know that on April 4th, 1865, kind of against Grant's advice, Lincoln with a very small contingent of Marines and his 12-year-old uh, son, Tad, that day, it's, it's quite a birthday present, accompanies his father to visit the conquered Confederate capital of, of Richmond um, at great risk to, I, I believe, his safety and health but important uh, politically because Lincoln launches discussions on the return of Virginia to the Union. And of course, also this experience gives Lincoln the opportunity to see for himself the effects of the Emancipation Proclamation. The 13th Amendment has not been ratified, but as Lincoln walks into Richmond, he's greeted by hordes of enslaved people who are actually liberated by his arrival and by the arrival of General Godfrey Wetzel and his Union troops, some black troops, actually. Um, this was the actual moment of emancipation and liberation that Lincoln had never experienced until that day in Richmond, facilitated or at least permitted by Ulysses S. Grant. I, I think one of the loveliest moments of their relationship occurred around this time when Robert Lincoln, a law student at Harvard, eager to join the Union Army, uh, but blocked at every turn by his fearful mother who had already lost a young son in the White House and was petrified that if Robert enlisted, she would lose him too. 
Robert finally persuades his father that he cannot um, endure the thought of never having served along with his contemporaries. But Lincoln has a great compromise idea. He will ask General Grant to put Robert, totally inexperienced law student, civilian law student, on his personal staff, clearly, although he doesn't write this in the letter, to minimize the, the, the physical danger to him in these final months of the war. And Lincoln writes a, a extraordinary private letter. Again, unimaginable that someone could write something like that, a president could write that without being ruined. Um, um, you know, Robert is not Hunter Biden, but he's still a kid getting a big favor. And Grant, uh, uh, he says, will you take him into your, uh, uh, your military family, I to bear the expense? I mean, Grant would not let Lincoln bear the expense. It cost Lincoln something like $50 to give Robert cash to take with him. But Robert spent the final weeks of the war attached to Grant's uh, small official family. And actually, talk about extraordinary experiences, got to be on the porch of the McLean house uh, the day that Robert E. Lee surrendered to, to Grant and, and saw Robert E. Lee. Um, may even have gotten introduced to Robert E. Lee. I'm not certain about that. I know that Lee shook hands with Grant's staff inside the, the uh, McLean parlor at Appomattox. Not sure whether he was introduced to Robert, uh, but quite a moment. And before that, of course, Lincoln and Grant and Sherman and Porter had some extraordinary councils of war, really councils of peace, uh, aboard the River Queen uh, to discuss the final days of the war. My favorite episode out of that um, encounter, I know this is a little bit out of order because I just had Lee surrendering, now I'm backing up a couple of weeks, but um, Grant and Sherman asked Lincoln, what is the official policy regarding Jefferson Davis? Um, he's, he's fled Richmond. We don't know where he's going. We're going to pursue him. What do we do when we get him? Uh, should, we, should we pursue him? And Lincoln doesn't answer directly. Um, he says, this reminds me of a story. That's kind of Lincoln's perpetual answer. This reminds me of a story. Uh, back in Illinois, there was a uh, uh, a, a man, a reformed drunkard, and uh, and uh, he had sworn off liquor and was behaving very well. But there was a big festive picnic in the town, and uh, they were serving uh, lemonade. But many many people were spiking their lemonade, and someone offered the reformed drunk a glass of lemonade. And he accepted it, and they said, well, would you like it to add a little bit of the touch of, uh, of whiskey to it? And he said, well, and Lincoln did this in an Irish accent, which I will not do. He said, well, I'll turn away, and if some of the liquor finds its way into my lemonade, into me lemonade, unbeknownst to me, I won't object. And no doubt the lemonade was spiked, and the, the reformed uh, uh, drinker had a fine time at the picnic. Uh, by which Sherman later wrote in his memoirs, I, I inferred that Lincoln would not be upset if, if Jefferson Davis escaped unbeknownst to him because of the tribulations it might cause if he was captured, tried, imprisoned, and or executed. Um, Lincoln was dead by the time... Uh, Davis was indeed captured in Georgia and imprisoned. Um, it would have been interesting to know how he would have related that final story um, to uh, uh, to the to the to the event itself. Of course, the final moment um, occurs for Lincoln and for Grant and his relationship to Lincoln on April fourteenth, eighteen sixty five. Uh, Grant and Lincoln's attendance at Ford's Theater that night had been widely advertised, and I think it, it provoked John Wilkes Booth to think he could kill both men at Ford's Theater. Uh, it always has provoked me to wonder if Grant might have, in fact, with his training and his toughness, have saved Lincoln instead. But by that time, Mary Lincoln and 
and Julia Grant had had enough squabbles at City Point about whose uh, um, whose uh, paddle wheel boat was should be the headquarters of this of their visits that Julia really did not want anything more to do with Lincoln. So she persuaded her husband to uh, to go to New Jersey to the New Jersey shore for a reunion with their family. They did not go to Ford's Theater, and of course. We don't know what their presence might have uh, done to either make that tragic day even more tragic or to prevent it from happening. But I believe Booth had Grant in his sights. Uh, there's even a report that he, he galloped past the Grant's uh, carriage around this time earlier that day, saw Grant in the carriage, spun around, came by for one more look, gave them a dirty look. That's what Julia remembered. And she thought it was the Booth, the actor. So one drama of that dramatic day was avoided. I, I, I love the way Grant wrote about Lincoln in his memoirs. Um, as certainly he can explain the relationship better than I. Um, and I think in between the lines of his recollections is that uh, are the strands of that simpatico political, personal, and military relationship that I think is unique in, uh, in American history. Maybe FDR and Marshall had it, but aside from that, I don't think any commander and president ever um, uh, thought alike as much as did Grant and Lincoln. 